Here is an Iowa Stereo Full Automatic Turntable System model PXE860. And if this design looks familiar, that's because this is one of those cheap turntables that I did a video about, which the experts on Reddit warned you not to watch. But this is one of the older variants. This one was actually made in 1999. And if you're wondering what it cost when it was new, I found this J&R catalog from 2001 featuring on the cover the new titanium Apple PowerBook G4 for $2,600. And also brand new in 2001 was a Philips 42-inch plasma TV standard definition for only $9,990. If we go all the way up to page 109, we have some turntables here, and here is the Iowa PX-E860. Includes cartridge and phono preamp designed for Iowa mini systems, but they also sold these for anybody to use who wanted a turntable for $119.99. At the time, the competition was this Gemini budget DJ turntable for only $99.99, and the Technics P-Mount turntable for $129.99. And you could still get a Technics SL1200 back then for $549. So those were the turntables available back in 2001. And this was one of the more inexpensive options of the time. And it's a design they're still making today with very similar models such as the Audio-Technica ATLP60 and the Sony PSLX300 USB and so on and so forth. Here's a quick look at the back. There's the model information sticker. It was made in China as all these are. And there you can see manufactured January 1999. And this one is going to need a little bit of work. First obvious thing is that there's no stylus on there. It's completely broken off. And if we lift off the platter mat, which is actually rubber, it's not one of those felt slip mats like you get with the Audio-Technica version. We spin it around, we can see the belt is on the motor spindle, but it's not attached properly to the platter. So that's going to need at least restringing, if not replacement. I'll have to see how good of a condition it's in. This one, unlike most of these, uses a plastic platter instead of aluminum. So it's a little bit more of a budget version of these but it does have the built-in preamp which has a switch back here and also has the artifact of where a voltage selector switch would go on some of these that were sold in different parts of the world but being a US version this one is only 420 volts this one actually has the platter clipped into place with a little c-clip so I'll need to remove that. You just take a small flat blade screwdriver and pry off the clip that's holding on the platter. Just have to be a little careful because that tends to go flying once it releases. Remove the sir clip, which holds the um, turns up. Oops, oh no. <laughs> oh well, we'll look for the sir clip later. There it goes. So that wasn't too hard to take off. Now we can remove the platter. I think I can see why this is having a problem. Look at that. Belt got all tangled up in the mechanism. So. I'll need to, uh, I may have to remove this gear to get this thing out of the way unless it, well, there's even more of it stuck around here. Let me fiddle around with this to get this belt loose. So I managed to get the belt untangled and it's still in one piece. So I could probably string it back on and the turntable would work. But I just wanted to show you the difference between one of the original belts these turntables come with and the replacement you can get. There's a seller in Indiana called River City Electronics which sells these belts. And this is one of those replacement belts for these turntables. And you can see it is quite a bit thicker than the original belt. It still fits and works fine, but 
The advantage of the thicker belt is that it gives you better torque and that helps improve the speed stability of these turntables which is a little bit lacking with the original belt. So it is a definitely a recommended upgrade. Even if you buy one of these brand new, you should still upgrade the belt. I actually had this belt on my Pioneer PL990 because after eight and a half years, I thought it was time to replace the belt on it. And it definitely was a good upgrade. But for now, I'm going to borrow this belt and put it on this Iowa and see if it works. So to replace the belt on one of these turntables is easy. Obviously, you take off the platter and remove the old belt like I did. And then you take the new belt and you wrap it around this center part of the underside of the platter and make sure it's completely flat all the way around. You don't want any twists in this belt. And they give you these finger holes so when you're putting the belt back on, you grab the belt like this and you hold it out while still keeping it straight like that. And then you place that on the spindle. Then you take the part of the belt that you're holding out with your finger and you place it over the motor pulley like that. And then you spin it around a couple times and you may see the tone arm come to life. So be prepared, it might try to drop the needle on the record. So you should raise up the tone arm so it doesn't do that. But in this case, it doesn't matter because the stylus is bad anyway, but. There we go. And we have our new belt installed. Now I'm going to reinstall this little clip. On most of these you won't need to do that, but on this one it is part of the design. Okay, that popped back into place. Now put the flatter mat back on. And now I'm going to work on replacing the stylus. So to replace the stylus on one of these turntables, you grab it by the sides on the plastic part and you tilt it down and then you just pull it off. And you can get an official Audio-Technica stylus or you can get one of these generic replacements on eBay for about $8. In my experience they sound pretty much the same. The model number of the stylus these use is 4211-D6. So just type that into eBay or Amazon or wherever you want to buy your stylus from. 4211-D6 and you can find the stylus for these. Here's the same kind of phono cartridge mounted in a standard head shell so it makes a little clearer of how to reinstall it. You can see this notch in the bottom of it. Normally it's sitting like that so you have to sort of do it from underneath. And this little hook on the back of it goes into that notch then you angle it into place and you should hear a click. So I'll do the same thing on this tone arm. Hear that click? So now the stylus is installed. So now it's time to test out this turntable. Notice that even after all these years, the automatic tone arm lowering still lowers it nice and gently. And when you go to plug one of these in for the first time, especially after you've moved it around, you should raise the tone arm because you may have accidentally triggered the automatic start feature and you don't want it to accidentally drop the stylus down on the platter. So here I go, I'm going to plug it in. Okay, I did not trigger the automatic start, but let's move the tone arm in and it starts spinning. Now let me see if the automatic return works. Yes it does. If you prefer to get a genuine Audio-Technica stylus for your turntable, the least expensive way I've found to get one is to buy an entire AT3600L cartridge that will come with the stylus. You can get them for around $13 on eBay, shipped to you directly from China. And it'll come in a little plastic bag like this. You get the phono cartridge with the stylus and even the little stylus protector, so that's nice in case you didn't get your turntable with one or you lost it. It's nice to have the stylus protector. Even includes the mounting hardware, although obviously we won't need it for this turntable. Nor will we need the entire cartridge, although you can keep this on hand as 
a backup in case you ever get a turntable which uses this type of phono cartridge. But in this case all we need is the stylus so we can just remove it from the cartridge and install it on our turntable and we're ready to go. I've seen these turntables listed for sale as broken with a very low price sometimes in almost new condition just because the belt had come off and the original owner did not know how to put it back on so now that you've watched this video you can take advantage of this and get it working very easily and here are some other beginners mistakes to avoid a common beginners mistake that people run into with these turntables is that when you're playing a record Either you can't hear any sound at all through your speakers or the sound is very weak and tinny even if the speaker is turned all the way up. Like that. You can just barely hear it. Well there's usually a very easy fix for that. The problem is that you don't have the built-in preamp turned on. Because I think these turntables normally come from the factory with it switched off. So what you have to do is switch it on. Now the location for the switch to do that varies depending on the model of the turntable. Some of them, like the Audio-Technica ATLP60 and the Sony PSLX300 USB, have the switch on the back of the turntable. While this one and other models have it underneath the platter. So in this particular case you have to remove the platter mat as you just saw me do and rotate the platter until one of the two holes in it is facing towards the back and then you'll see a switch down in there usually marked either on and off like this one or marked phono and line and what you have to do is switch it to on or line it's the same thing if the switch is on the back switch it to the position that says line and now when you're playing your record you should have plenty of volume through your speakers Or you may have the opposite problem when using one of these turntables with a receiver or amplifier that has a phono input or an external preamp. The sound may be very loud and bassy and distorted. In that case, just move that switch to the position that says either off or phono and that should solve the problem. Another beginner's mistake is taking the 45 RPM adapter and putting it underneath an LP when playing it. Now you may laugh, but I've actually heard of and seen several people doing this. Probably because they're young and they have never seen a 45 RPM record with the large center hole, which is what this adapter is designed for. Okay, so I really don't know what this is, but I'm going to put this under here and hoping that this will allow me to scratch it. <laughs> One of the annoying things about these turntables is that there's no clamp to hold the tone arm in place when you're not using it. Which makes it very important to have that stylus protector. Otherwise, if the tone arm gets knocked loose, such as if you're carrying this thing around or you're transporting it in your car, the tone arm can easily get knocked out of its little holder and it can end up bouncing around. And if you don't have that little stylus protector on, it could easily damage your stylus. But one thing I found that works very well holding the tone arm in place is a small sized binder clip. What you do is you squeeze it open a little bit and put it right on top of this tone arm rest and then you flip down the little hooks. So that way it does a pretty good job of holding the tone arm in place. Obviously if you really bang this thing around it can still come loose but with normal carrying around or whatever it's not going to come loose when you have this clamp on there. If you want to check the speed of your turntable, either because you think it might be playing slightly too fast or slightly too slow, or just because you're a perfectionist 
and you want to make sure it's playing as close to the correct speed as possible. There are several different ways to do it. The simplest way is you could play a record and then you can find a CD or an MP3 or a download or streaming or whatever of the same song and then just compare them by ear. Although that's not always entirely accurate because sometimes the record companies screw up or sometimes they even do it deliberately where either the record or the CD is made too slow or too fast compared to what the recording is supposed to be played at. So sometimes even if your turntable is playing at exactly the correct speed you may still hear a difference in pitch between a record and a digital copy of the same music. So if you want something more accurate than that there are several ways to do it and there are plenty of videos already on this topic. I know Techmoan just recently did a video about it but there are basically two different ways to do it. One is with a strobe disc. You can print this out yourself from various websites. It's usually a free download. Sometimes you have to register for the website but usually it's a free download of a PDF or an image of a strobe disc and you can print this out. You just have to make sure your printer is set to print at exactly the right size. You have to make sure it's not scaling it up or down in size. But once you print that out and you punch a hole in the middle, you can put it on your turntable. I like to have it on top of a record when it's playing. That way you can compensate for the added weight of the record and the weight of the tone arm playing the record because otherwise if you just put the strobe disc on the platter by itself and you start spinning without anything playing and you adjust it according to this once you actually put a record on it'll be playing slightly too slow due to the added weight so that's why I like to put it on top of a record and start the record playing with the needle in the groove and that way you'll get the most accurate reading. With a strobe disc another thing you'll need is some kind of electric light which operates at your AC mains line frequency which is usually 60 Hertz for North America and 50 Hertz for most of the rest of the world. Sometimes the strobe disc will have markings for both but in this case this one's only for 60 Hertz. This will work with incandescent lights, halogen lights, many old-fashioned tube style fluorescent lights, and some of the cheaper LEDs such as the kind you can get at the dollar store. It'll even work with a little neon night light if you have one of those, but it usually will not work with compact fluorescent light bulbs or more expensive LEDs because those operate at a different frequency. But once you get the appropriate kind of light shining on this, you'll just look at the lines on the strobe disc when it's playing and they should appear to be stationary. That means it's running at exactly 33 and a third RPM. If the lines were shifting slightly to the left or slightly to the right, that would mean the turntable is spinning slightly too fast or too slow. Now we can switch to 45 RPM. And this is a little more difficult to see, but you can see now the 45 RPM strobe mark looks as if it's stationary. So that's how you check your speed with a strobe disc. You can also check it with an app on your smartphone. There are various different apps you can use to do that. However, those are limited by the accuracy of the motion sensor in your smartphone. So those are usually not quite as accurate as using a strobe disc. On the bottom of one of these turntables, you'll find several holes marked 33 and 45. These are the holes to access the speed adjustment trimmers for 33 and a third and 45 RPM. In this case there's actually several sets of holes marked 45 because they're accommodating different types of motors but only one of them actually has the speed adjustment trimmer in it and there's the speed adjustment trimmer for 33 RPM. To adjust the speed of your turntable, the tricky part is that you have to find a way to prop it up so that you can access those speed adjustment holes in the bottom of the turntable while it's in operation. And the best way I found to do that is with a pair of small bookshelf speakers. They're just right for propping up the turntable so that you have enough room to access it from underneath while it's still level and can be used. 
and it helps to have a little flashlight so you can see those holes you're trying to stick your screwdriver in to adjust. I happen to have on hand the same kind of motor that's in these turntables and I'll show you what you're actually doing from underneath. You can see these two holes in the bottom of the motor marked L and H. L is for 33 and a third RPM, H is for 45 RPM. And you can see the holes have gaskets on them to keep the dust out. So you have to take a small flat blade screwdriver and poke through that gasket to get to the adjustment inside there. But the tricky thing is if your screwdriver is too small it's just going to spin around and not make contact with the screw in there to make that adjustment. And if it's too big it's going to short out against the metal body of the motor and if that happens it'll suddenly increase in speed to the motor's maximum speed and whatever record you're playing will sound like chipmunks. It's not going to damage the motor but it's just annoying if that happens. So you need to find a screwdriver that's just the right size to get into that hole and you'll feel it drop down into the slot once you rotate it and you find that position that adjustment is in and then you can turn it left or right to make that adjustment without shorting out against the case of the motor. It may help to wrap some electrical tape around the screwdriver just to insulate it. So you stick in your screwdriver, you have to poke through that gasket first, and then you twist it until you feel it drop down into the slot. So you just drop down into the slot and now you can make your adjustment. It doesn't take much, just about that much of turning it is probably enough to adjust the speed. So that's exactly what you're doing when you take your screwdriver and you poke it into one of these holes and you make your adjustment. And ideally you would be doing that from underneath while also looking from the top at your strobe or the app on your phone to see when you get it to the correct speed. And you just turn the adjustment slightly left to right until you get to the correct speed. And don't forget to switch to 45 RPM and also adjust that. Because even if you don't play that many 45 RPM records, once you have everything set up to make the adjustment, you might as well do it. It doesn't really take that much longer. I wanted to see if the speed adjustment trimmers in this turntable have enough range to allow it to play at 78 RPM without needing to modify the circuitry. Because you can get a 3mm stylus designed for playing 78 RPM records for this cartridge. It is the 4211-D3. That's a 3 mil 78 RPM stylus. So that's what I have installed. It's green for a little black dot there. And with the turntable set to what would normally be 45 RPM, I adjusted the trimmer and I discovered that the speed trimmer in the motor does have enough range to allow you to get it to play at 78 RPM. At that extreme of an adjustment away from what it would normally be playing at, it is rather touchy. But with the help of a strobe disc, such as this one, which you can print out online for free, and a little patience, I was able to make that adjustment. So now it does spin at 78 RPM, and I'll give you a little sample of what that sounds like. Grandfather and the children are watching some of the animals in the barnyard. Listen closely and see whether you can tell each animal by its sound. Ready? Here's the first one. You heard the brown and white cow, didn't you? Now listen carefully to this sound. Yes, that was the mother duck. Here's something else. First you heard the big black horse, and then her frisky little colt. However, if you're an aficionado of 16 and 2 thirds RPM records, you're out of luck, because even with the motor adjusted to its slowest possible speed, it still spins too fast to play at 16 RPM. One of the common criticisms of these turntables is that you cannot upgrade the phono cartridge, and that is true. It's only designed to use the AT3600 cartridge that's permanently affixed to the tone arm.
However, you can upgrade the stylus. The original stylus it comes with is a conical stylus, but you can upgrade it to an elliptical stylus, which will follow the grooves of the record more accurately and give you better sound quality with less mistracking and distortion, especially towards the inner grooves of the record. There are two choices available. The Fansteel 4211-DE, available for $15 on eBay. As it says on the back, is a 0.4 by 0.7 mil elliptical stylus, or you can get an LP Gear CFN 3600LE stylus. Now this happens to be in the entire cartridge. I bought that because I wanted to use it on my other turntables, but you can buy just the stylus, which it mentions down here, is the CFN 3600LE. That cost about $29 on Amazon, and as it says there, it's a 0.3 by 0.7 mil elliptical stylus. The fan steel is just a plain green color with nothing printed on the front of it. While the LP gear stylus is a nice dark blue color with their logo on the front of it. So if you like your turntable to look a little more stylish, maybe it's worth getting this one just because it looks nicer. Now I'll give you some audio samples comparing how the original Audio-Technica conical stylus sounds compared to the two elliptical stylus upgrades available from fan steel and LP gear. Contemporary music means up-to-date, innovative, and constantly changing. As a client of Network, you'll receive new releases reflecting current musical trends. It stands to reason that if your project is to be current, then so should your music. Sound great? Good. Contemporary music means up-to-date, innovative, and constantly changing. As a client of Network, you'll receive new releases reflecting current musical trends. It stands to reason that if your project is to be current, then so should your music. Sound great? Good. Contemporary music means up-to-date, innovative, and constantly changing. As a client of Network, you'll receive new releases reflecting current musical trends. It stands to reason that if your project is to be current, then so should your music. Sound great? Good. Now I'm going to measure the tracking force. As I showed and explained in my cheap turntables video, because this type of tone arm uses a spring instead of a counterweight, you need to measure it at the same height as the playing surface of a record in order to get an accurate reading. So that's why I've removed the platter and propped up the scale in this manner. And if we put the tone arm on the scale, We get a reading of 3.5 grams, which is exactly the factory specification for this kind of turntable. Here's the modification to disable the automatic return mechanism on this turntable. It's controlled by this large white plastic gear here, which is driven by the center spindle. 
you can see if I move the tone arm towards the middle of the record this metal piece begins to move and it triggers the mechanism and if I move the center spindle by hand which would normally be driven by the motor you can see it's beginning to return the tone arm to the rest position and if I keep going it'll lower it down so what we have to do is very simple we just remove this large white gear by removing the screw and removing the gear it just simply lifts off and now you can see when I move the tone arm to the middle there's nothing to engage the auto return mechanism so the platter can continue to spin regardless of the position of the tone arm now if the platter and the belt and the platter mat reinstalled and it's now plugged in you can see if I move the tone arm all the way to the middle continue spinning without picking up the tone arm and if you want to re-enable the auto return mechanism it's very simple just reinstall the gear you just make sure this metal piece is facing the same position it was before that is facing the center spindle and you of course reinstall the screw holding it in place so now when our tone arm gets to the middle it'll once again pick it up and return it to the rest position and there's some trimmers for adjusting the tone arm L in is lead in that adjusts where the automatic start feature drops the stylus down on the record RET is return that adjusts where it picks up the stylus at the end of the record then SW is the tone arm switch that controls the adjustment of how it automatically starts the turntable spinning when you move the tone arm away from the rest position and as for the question of whether or not this kind of turntable will damage your records I could make a whole video about that topic but for now I just like to put forth that the same world-renowned audiophile Michael Framer who is responsible for popularizing the notion that cheap record players like this Crosley Cruiser will destroy your records in as little as five plays says that this kind of turntable will take good care of your records. Crosley turntables are very bad for this business. Kids are going to buy these cruddy turntables. They'll play Dark Side of the Moon five times and then the grooves will all be chewed up and they'll say, this is a stupid hobby. Why did I get into this? So you all destroy your records in five plays. Yeah, you think so? I mean, I'm not, oh, I know. Yeah, see, I'm not, I don't know much about turntables oh, anymore. Oh, are they really? Oh, all this stuff. Just, uh, these things are track. Barnes & Noble here, they sell this very inexpensive turntable. It would not be my first choice, in all honesty, but I decided I wanted to see how good or bad it was, so I brought my stylus pressure gauge, and I measured it. And it's, it's not bad. It's three and a half grams. It's not going to ruin your records. It'll take care of your records. So I can say that as cheap as this is, it's okay. So those are some of the repairs, modifications, and upgrades you can do to these affordable turntables. If you have a question or problem that has not been covered by this video, I can't guarantee that I'll have the solution, but feel free to leave a comment and I'll do my best to help out.